Uh, hey everyone, thank you for taking time to join uh, today's webinar. My name is Meet Pakdev and I'm a senior product manager. Uh, with me, I have Srinath. Srinath, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Srinath Gotur. I'm a specialist, uh, senior specialist solution architect with AWS. I've been with AWS for three years. Thanks, Srinath. And today we're going to talk to you guys about uh, what's new in Amazon Document DB. Um, so for today's webinar, we have a few things on the agenda. For folks who are not familiar with Document DB, we will cover an overview, uh, gonna walk you through what Document DB is, uh, when you should use Document DB. Uh, then we'll go into what's new with Document DB. And then we have a few deep dives uh, for, our, for the various features that were recently released. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So what's Document DB? Document DB is AWS's highly scalable, highly durable, and fully managed database service for mission critical Mongo workloads. Uh, when customers ask us, you know, what are the benefits, you know, why we should use Document DB, we kind of like to think of it through three pillars. Number one, speed and scale. Document DB is fast uh, and it's highly scalable. So customers can scale compute in Document DB within minutes. Um, several components of Document DB, for example, storage and IO, are auto scaling. So, you know, customers don't need to go and add additional storage or provisional additional IO. Uh, storage and IO will automatically scale. Storage, for example, scales automatically from 10 gigs all the way up to 64 terabytes. Uh, for customers looking to scale out reads, uh, we also support 15 replica instances. Uh, this gives you millions of reads per second. Uh, that's, you know, tens of millions per minute. So, you know, massive scale for customers with really heavy workloads. Um, and it's also globally distributed. So not only is it fast and scalable, you can also replicate your data across several AWS regions uh, for disaster recovery. It's also fully managed. One of the biggest pain points that we see from customers trying to use the service is management, uh, especially if they're running databases such as MongoDB on premises, or on EC2, that database management is not trivial. Uh, customers don't like to do backups. They don't like to set up monitoring, alerting, batching. Um, with Document DB, you get all of this right out of the box. Uh, you can deploy your cluster across multiple availability zones with just a few clicks in the console. Um, capabilities such as metrics, backup, batching, security, all of that is available by default and also turned on by default. Um, so all you need to do is, you know, create a cluster and you're up and running. Last but not the least, it's MongoDB compatible. Uh, this was really important to a lot of our customers. Um, you know, a lot of our customers actually bring pretty stable, established Mongo workloads to DocumentDB. Uh, so DocumentDB is compatible with Mongo. So, you know, if you're using existing tools or drivers um, that are compatible with Mongo, you don't need to stop using them for document DB. The same tools, the same drivers uh, continue to work. Um, and you know you can lift and shift your applications with little or no change. And we support hundreds of APIs, operators, and stages. Um, and obviously, if you see any Mongo APIs that we don't support, uh, you know, please let us know. We're always working backwards from what our customers are looking for. Uh, we actually have very good data also on you know, things that our customers are trying to use. Uh, that we're not supporting today. So we're always you know, keeping an eye both proactively uh, and also reactively with regards to what our customers are trying to do with our service. So before we go further and talk about what's new in the service, a question often comes up, this is all great, but why should I use a document database? I think to kind of start things off, JSON is everywhere, right? So if you, if you kind of look at the JSON data model, it's it's very natural. Uh, it's a very natural data model. No one really thinks about data in terms of tables, right? Like when you think of data, you think about a document. Uh, you know, document could have fields like a name, a phone number, an address. Um, you know, that's typically how us, like we as people imagine data to be. Because of that, JSON's pretty much pretty much gotten everywhere. A lot of APIs return their results in JSON as well. Uh, may it be for search, may it be for databases, may it be for graph. So JSON as a data format is, is pretty ubiquitous. Um, and you need to store that data somewhere, right? And that's why you need a, a document database that provides you with 
rich query capabilities. In addition to that, um, you know, it's a flexible format. If you compare it to, let's say, relational databases, which are great in, in its own way, uh, but they're not super flexible. Uh, for example, you're using a traditional enterprise database and you want to go and add a new row in your database. That's probably a, a DBA conversation. You can't just, you know, wake up in the morning and be like, um, sorry, I meant column. You can't just go wake up in the morning and add a new column to your database. These decisions for you know, relational databases are often well thought out. While with a document database, you know, it's it's user defined schema. So you can go ahead and add additional fields. Um, you don't need to design for that. As your app grows, uh, your schema also grows. Uh, and last but not the least, you know, it's a it's a natural data model and pretty much the de facto API output. Uh, if you look at all the applications out there, uh, when you should use a document database, there's multiple use cases. Uh, we'll call out one that we see pretty commonly is gaming. Uh, so, in, in on the screen, you right now see a document uh, of a gamer where they have a user ID, a username, a name, um, and let's say you want this user now is playing a game called Exploding Snails. Um, and while playing the game, they have a high score, a rank, and bonus levels. You can go ahead and add those fields to your JSON document for this user. Um, and it's a very common use case for gaming customers, um, something we've seen quite a lot uh, when we look at who the customers are that are using our service. That's it tomorrow. There's a new promotion. Um, you know, Again, it's user-defined schema, so you can just go ahead and add fields to your documents very easily. Um, who are the customers using the service? Well, to start with, we have Amazon, uh, but Amazon's not the only customer. We have several other customers um, using DocumentDB. Obviously, you know, we use it quite extensively internally, but uh, if you kind of look at some of the logos on your screen, um, it, it cuts across verticals and use cases. So it's not very like specific to you know one segment. We, we've seen broad adoption across a lot of different use cases. And this kind of boils down to, again, JSON being that pretty standard data format uh, out there uh, for applications today. Um, how is DocumentDB architected for NoSQL workloads at scale? Uh, Srinath, who's actually one of our, one of our architects, um, I think would be very well equipped to kind of answer this question. We have a slide here that walks us through our architecture. Srinath, why don't you take it away and sure. you know, walk us through how we architect it for scale? Thanks, Pete. Yeah, all right. Uh, in this section, we are going to uh, dive into architecture of document DB. And uh, let's, uh, as usual, we'll let's start with a question, right? How document DB architecture for NoSQL workloads really scale? So let's step back and uh, do a little review on architecture. If you look at this slide, uh, the way document DB was designed, uh, it's basically to offer a number of really interesting advantages, mainly from uh, the up separation of compute and storage. That's the fundamentally we separated both. It's completely decoupled. So if you look at other database systems where both storage and computer are co-located and very tightly coupled together, in document db we actually split those into two independent operations so the distributed storage volume uh, its primary responsibility is for uh, durable storage which includes like uh, your storage of your data indexes and anything related to data that's the uh, responsibility of uh, your distributed storage on the other side of the compute that's basically where uh, the it's basically machines where all our clients interacts with so your application will talk to the compute instance and the distributed storage volume is in the background. So document DB, uh, if you look at the diagram, document DB has got a single writer in the cluster, which what we primarily refer to primary. Uh, primary will basically, uh, the primary instance or primary node that basically handles all your writes. So the replica, which are on the other machines, which are the other machines that basically uh, has a responsibility of taking all your read responsibility. It does a couple additional uh, functions. First is uh, in terms of being taking uh, over responsibility of the primary. In the event of primary goes down, then automatically one of these secondary instances becomes primary. And then, like I said, uh, it takes care of the responsibility of uh, doing the read. Like Meet explained in the previous slides, uh, document DB supports 15 read replicas. So which means you can have 15 read replicas and we have mechanism in which you can specify 
uh, which replica to become primary or you can make it uh, elect by itself uh, the secondary node as a primary uh, when the primary goes down it will convert into primary node so the distributed storage volume uh, basically stores the data automatically six times uh, under the cover across all three three different availability zones uh, twice in each availability zone. If you look at the diagram where you see uh, the yellow highlighted yellow, uh, you see that the data has been copied across uh, two copies across all availability zone. Same way the green copied across to, uh, each each availability zone. So we grow across uh, three availability zones. That sort of all set up by default, regardless of the number of compute instance that we connect to it. So with that, uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, what's new in Amazon Document DB. Yeah, so moving on, I think our goal here is really to just work backwards from customers. So everything that you see here on this slide are capabilities that either our customers have asked us for directly or we strongly felt like that's something our customers are going to need uh, in the short to long term. Um, so pretty much everything uh, starting the service launch in 2019 um, through all the way to 2022 May now, We've had you know, several launches. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some of the more recent ones. For example, Performance Insights, which we just launched in April, uh, Geospatial, which we just launched uh, October and November of last year, AWS Backup Integration, uh, Global Clusters. These were all, uh, at various points, a top feature request uh, from, from some of our customers. With that, uh, let's let's kick it off. Let's the first kind of feature that we're going to double click into is AWS backup integration for Document DB, and I think Srinath's got some some cool demos and a little bit more information about how the feature works. Yeah. So let's uh, uh, before dive into demo, let's talk about uh, the backup integration. So Amazon Document DB has a built-in uh, backup enabled by default with a retention period of minimum one day. Depending on the recovery point objective, you can configure this retention period up to 35 days and perform point in time recovery restore up to a specific point in time within that retention period. So for any longer uh, backup retention, you can use AWS backup service uh, to create automated periodic snapshot on your uh, uh, document DB cluster. So uh, AWS backup uh, service allows you to create and manage your backups across AWS compute, storage, and uh, database services using a centralized backup policy. Some of the advantages, like you can create a common backup policy for your organization, and you can apply that policies across multiple databases. Together with the AWS organization, AWS backup basically enables you to centrally deploy all your data protection backups policies uh, to configure and to manage and to grow your backup activity across all your AWS accounts and uh, uh, regions. With the backup, uh, with the, the AWS uh, console or even using CLI, you can create a single backup policy. Like I said, uh, create a single backup policy that centralizes all your backup and restore for Amazon Document DB across all AWS regions and accounts. So AWS backups automated, uh, basically automated backup schedules and retention policies to manage the lifecycle of uh, Document DB snapshot, which were previously managed manually. So with that, let me quickly jump on to the demo to show you how easy to set up the backup, uh, how the integration works, and how easy to set up the backup uh, from the backup service for Document DB cluster. OK, so I have a Document DB cluster here. Now I'm going to uh, AWS Backup. So you can go to uh, Services, and you can select AWS Backup. You can hit Create Backup Plan. Once you are in backup plan, you basically choose. If you have a template, predefined template, you can use that, or you can use the, you can plan it using a JSON template. You can create your own JSON expression, or simply create a built new plan. So I'm giving a name for the backup plan. And then you basically give a rule, what uh, how you wanted to set up your backup. So I'm just creating a demo plan, demo rule. Here, uh, all your backup goes to a vault. There is a default vault, or you can create your own uh, backup vault. So in this case, for the demo, for the purpose of demo, I'm creating a default, I'm using the default vault. 
So, and then you can specify what is your backup frequency, whether you want to take it hourly, every 12 hours, daily, weekly, you can specify your backup frequency. And then uh, you can specify the uh, backup window, how, uh, when do you want it that the backup needs to happen. So by default, there is a default settings and you can also customize your backup window by specifying which time window you wanted the backup to happen. And then you can also have an option to transition your backup to a cold storage. Uh, with that, uh, there is a uh, you can keep the cold storage, and you can say if you say never, it won't expire. Otherwise, after the uh, the cold storage retention period finishes, it automatically drops those backup. So in this case, I'll say never, and then you can specify your retention period, like how long you want to retain uh, once you specify it. And then uh, also in backup, you can specify the backup to be in the same region or across region or cross account. So we do support cross-region backup. So in this case, I have to go with the same region. I'll say like uh, I can pick other regions, but uh, for the purpose of demo, I'm choosing uh, Virginia. And then I'll say like create plan. So it basically creates a plan. For now, we have created a plan. Now we need to assign a resource to that plan. So now I'm saying like assign resource. And I can say like I can include all resource type or I can specify like I wanted specific resource type. Here I'm choosing like I want document DB as my resource for backup. And then and then I can choose like it shows like all the available clusters. In my case, I have only one cluster. Otherwise, it will show you all the clusters. So I can choose the cluster and then specify like uh, if I wanted to exclude any particular resource, I can do that. And then uh, basically say like create assigned resources. Uh, now that's a uh, resource is assigned. Now what happens is it, it uh, executes the backup. Now, sometimes we wanted to run uh, like a, we wanted to do a, a on-demand backup since this is a demo. My backup will start only the next day at 5 o'clock. So instead, I wanted to do an on-demand backup. So I'm creating an on-demand backup just to show you like how quickly I can, I can select the uh, window. I create backup now so that it will backup immediately. And then um, I, I let it choose its default role. It creates an uh, IAM role. Or if you already have an existing IAM role, then you can choose the IAM role. Now my backup is getting created. Once the backup is created, you will see that backup completed. Now you can see that uh, the status is completed. So the backup is available. Now that, it, that's simple to create a backup. When we wanted to restore, you basically, you can go onto your vault. You can see that uh, you have a backup. It shows you the recovery point, all the different. If you have a multiple recovery point, it will show you all the recovery point. You can select that. And then basically, you can say like a restore. And then you can choose where do you want to restore your uh, backup to. So I can specify like the, the cluster where I wanted to create a backup. And I'm, I'm not giving any preferences, but you can specify if you have any AZ preference. And then I'm leaving all the default port and the version is 4.0. If you wanted to encrypt, you can enable the encryption here. And then you can also turn audit log and profile log. And then I'm choosing a default role here and I click restore backup. Now the backup, uh, the restore process started. So with that, uh, you saw after the backup, we did restore. Now the restore has been completed. As soon as the restore is completed, you can see the status that it's completed. And it also created a, a, an instance here. The cluster has been created. If I go to my clusters, you'll see that demo restore cluster has been created with all the data get restored into this particular cluster. Now, as a user, you can go and add additional replicas, additional uh, read replicas to this cluster. That way you will have closer to your production uh, workload. That's that's pretty much I wanted to show as part of the demo. Thank you. Back to you, Meet. All right, so the next feature we have here is uh, our back user-defined roles. Uh, this was a very, was a top feature request from our enterprise customers uh, who needed granular access. Uh, I think Srinath will We'll do a deep dive on, on this as well, and we have a really nice demo in store for you.
So, uh, so security. Before I go into the demo, let's talk quickly about uh, the rollback access security control. So, um, security is job zero here at AWS. One thing we rolled out uh, was our back uh, feature in Document DB. So, you can restrict access uh, to the action that users can perform on Amazon Document DB using a role-based uh, uh, access control. So, basically, the role-based access control works by granting one or more uh, roles to a user. So the role determines what type of operation that a user can perform on a specific database. So Amazon Document DB currently support uh, built-in uh, roles that are scoped to the database level, including read, read, write, read any database, and cluster admin. These are all the four roles uh, available. And common use cases for, uh, for uh, role-based access control includes enforcing least privilege uh, by creating users with read-only access to both the database in a cluster and a multi-tenant application basically designed that enables a single user to access a given database in a cluster. So with that, let's quickly jump on to the demo. So I have a Cloud9 environment. I'm going to log in. I have a, I logged into my cluster. You can see that uh, I have a, it's a three node cluster. That's what you are seeing here. The document DB getting started document DB. That's the cluster I, I logged in now. So if I do show users, you will see that uh, the list of users who are currently available in document DB. So I have two users, lab user, who has a root level admin permit privileges. And then I have an app admin who have access at uh, uh, the cluster as well as the admin is a cluster admin read write any database and also DB admin database. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two different users. One is the app user who have a pretty much like an application owner where he can read and write. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a an user app user as a user ID, and then I given a password, and then I'm specifying the roles. The role this particular user has is read write uh, against the product database. So now I have given uh, that particular user. I'm also creating another user who is going to be primarily a read only user. So people like analyst who just wanted to analyze the data. So I'm creating a new user called analyst user uh, with the role of read on the same uh, database called product. So now we have two different additional users on top of uh, admin we created. Now, if I sh if I do show users, you can see that now I have additional two users which I created: uh, app user and uh, analyst user. Now, I'm going to log out so that I can log in back with the newly created user. So I logged out. Now I'm saying like uh, authenticate me for this particular user with the password. What I created is I'm supplying that password. So now I'm logged in with that uh, as user. Now I'm going to the products database. Now I'm going to insert few records because this particular user has a right permission. So I'm going to show that I'm able to insert multiple record. Now you can see that I inserted three rows and it acknowledged saying that the, all the three records got inserted. Now I'm switching back to, uh, let's say like, uh, let's let's do a quick uh, read that query. This user also, let, let's do query on the record which he inserted. So see, you, I, I've, I inserted three rows and I'm looking for, hey, get me a, a catalog where the name equals to Kindle Fire, and it returned me the record. So this particular user can do both read and write. Now do the same thing. Let's log out uh, from this user and log in as uh, the read-only user to test it. I'm logging now as an analyst user. I'm using the same product database, products database. Now I'm saying like db.products, sorry, so db.catalog is the collection name. So it, it, I can, I'm able to read. Let's try inserting a new record 
to see if I'm able to uh, insert a record for this user. Since this user is a read-only user, uh, now I'm saying like insert a new record, it will say like authorization failure. So which means this user has only, since he has only read-only access. So now this is the demo quickly. I want to show you like how you can do a fine-grained role-based access at the database level and collection levels. With hey, Sheena, so, quick yeah. question on this. So yeah. you showed uh, database level access. Um, yeah. I think one of the things we recently added was also collection level access. Yeah, you uh, can do that at collection level as well. Gotcha. So if, for instance, let's say I had the catalog collection, and if I wanted um, analyst user to have read permissions only on the catalog user, uh, this feature will let you do that. Correct. OK. Yeah, I think that's also a pretty pretty common use case. We've been hearing more and more of that. Yeah, a lot of customers uh, are asking at the collection level uh, fine grain permission. So this will allow. And like I said, right, it's we, I showed demo on creating a user. You can also create different roles, role level, and then assign the same role to multiple users. Let's say you have multiple application, and you have a application based access control you want to create. You can create a specific role saying that that particular role have these read read permission only, then you can assign that role to multiple users. So there are a lot many features you can do the fine grain access at uh, document DB. Makes sense. Cool. Uh, switching back uh, to the slides, we'll walk you through a few more demos. All right, moving on. Uh, one of the key features, this actually was one of our, our top three feature requests was the ability to replicate data across multiple AWS regions. So for that, we re uh, released global clusters uh, in Q3 of last year. The reason this is super important is because um, some of our larger customers, enterprise customers, typically want uh, the ability to recover from regional outages. Now, to be clear, regional failures or regional outages for AWS is very rare. Um, you know, it doesn't happen often, but it's always good to have an insurance policy in place if that were to happen. So. To accomplish that, Global Clusters is a, a new feature that enables you to replicate your data up to five AWS regions. So you could have one primary AWS region and five secondary AWS regions for your document DB cluster, totaling up to six regions. For each secondary region, you can also have 16 replicas. So that's a total of 90 instances of the size of your choice across six AWS regions. One of the key differentiators we have here versus other, let's say, NoSQL database solutions is we use storage-based replication to replicate your data across regions. And the latencies are typically less than a second. Uh, and the, the way we're able to do that is, let's say you're inserting your data here in region one. Once your data is persisted to your storage, the storage has a, side pro, uh, a sidecar running that actually replicates that data across the various regions. So your compute instances do not take part in this replication uh, sync, and that really frees up your compute resources. So let's say you go from one region to three regions, that doesn't really have an impact to your workload. Your performance, your throughput continues to be the same because all of the replication is pushed down to the storage volume. And we actually incur the cost of whatever extra compute that needs to needs to run uh, alongside your storage to do the replication. Uh, and a lot of our customers really like this benefit because you know customers traditionally have had to make the trade-off, uh, which is kind of on the lines of, hey, if I go from one region to two region, my performance slows down by 10 sec, 10%, 20%, 30%. Uh, that doesn't happen with global clusters, at least the way uh, document DB is uh, architected. One of the other benefits you get is you can run secondary clusters headless. What this means is you actually don't need to have a compute node for your secondary clusters. All you need is, is, is storage across regions. You can absolutely do that. Um, you don't need to run the instances in your secondary regions. This oftentimes is cost effective. So if you're okay with recovery times of five minutes, 10 minutes, you know you can run your secondary clusters headless without any compute nodes. Uh, last but not the least, secondary clusters could be promoted to a primary cluster in, in less than in minutes. So, you know, if, if speed is important to you, you want to be able to recover from a regional outage quickly. Um, you know, the actual upgrade or the promotion takes about a minute, but the whole process, you know, depending on if you want to make it manual or automated, um, could be done, you know, in the single digit minutes timeframe. 
Uh, kind of moving on, one of the other features we released also late last year was a JDBC driver. So JDBC driver enables customers to visualize their JSON data with BI tools such as Tableau and MicroStrategy. It also gives customers the ability to run SQL queries on JSON data with tools like DB Visualizer, SQL Quirrell, um, and DBver. The SQL queries part is actually interesting because even though we are a JSON store, we still do get a lot of customers who like to use SQL. So while their data is in JSON, a typical question that comes up is like, okay, how do I query that data using SQL? Uh, the JDBC driver makes this easy for you. So you just download the client tool, um, choose your favorite SQL query explorer, and you know you can go ahead and now start querying your data sitting in JSON using uh, SQL. Last but not the least, this is open source. So it's one of the first open source projects that the Document DB team built on. The GitHub repository is on your screen. Um, you know, feel free to take a look if you if you want to. You know, file issues. We are pretty um, diligent at looking at those. Or if you want to send over a contribution, this is fully open source, and we'd love to work with you or partner with you to make this tool better. Um, it's kind of double clicking into where all you can use it from. So you can use it from Tableau. This happens to be one of our most common um, BI tools. And the way to do that is you install the document DB JDBC driver, the, the Tableau connector, and then you'll start seeing document DB as a supported source uh, in the Tableau UX. Once you do that, you know, everything that Tableau offers is at your disposal. You can start slicing and dicing the data. You can use the, the live connection mode or the extract connection mode, whichever one works best for you. You can see the various relationships between the data. Uh, each collection gets mapped as a table because uh, you do need to normalize the data for a BI tool to make sense of it. Uh, but all of that's done for you. And you know, if you have a nested collection, you know those get mapped as virtual tables and all of that is automatic. You can change um, the mapping if you'd like, but if not, the defaults work pretty well, generally speaking. Um, you know, just another example of what uh, a BI chart would look like. Uh, in this case, we are um, looking at COVID cases filtered by different countries, which was then mapped as a BI dashboard, something, you know, customers have tried to do similar use cases, not exactly the same data set, but that's some of, one of the benefits you get with the JDBC driver is visualization. And last but not the least, uh, SQL queries, so you can do Simple select, select from where style queries. You can also do joins, uh, group buys, order buys, all of the, the typical SQL, ANSI SQL query syntax that you expect. Uh, JDBC driver makes that work for you uh, for your document DB data. All right, uh, moving on, geospatial. So geospatial uh, was another pretty, pretty top requested feature. Um, that, that we announced, I want to say, October of last year. Uh, but before we get into geospatial, and we do have a demo for this, which we'll walk, walk you through in just a bit, uh, what is geospatial? So geospatial is particularly used for use cases where you need to uh, denote data with a particular location. This location could be a city, this location could be a country, uh, but anything that deals with location or geography uh, falls in the geospatial kind of bucket of things. And why does it matter? Uh, we actually have customers who are trying to answer questions as, you know, where are the five nearest drivers? Like, let's say you're building a ride sharing application. You want to be able to answer those queries. Or if you have a typical retail store, um, you want to be able to answer which store is the closest with, with, a, with an item in stock. Um, and to answer those queries, you need geospatial uh, capabilities and specifically a geospatial index. Because without an index, all of these queries would be extremely slow. So DocumentDB added support for geospatial indexing. And with this index, you're able to perform uh, fast lookups between two geospatial objects. And we'll kind of double click into what, what that means um, by kind of looking at the how. So in this case, uh, on the screen, you see a sample document about a diner. It's called the, the Reading Diner. It's located in Massachusetts and it's got a location. So it's a, the location is denoted in latitude and longitude. Now what you would do for a data set like this, and this is a restaurant's data, data set, is you would actually create an index of type 2D sphere. 
this is a geospatial index type. Once you create this index, um, the document DB query engine will index all the points, which is the location for this data set um, as index entries. And then you'll be able to perform various type of operations. For example, you'll be able to use the geo near operation to find all matches sorted by distance. You'll be able to use near sphere to find all matches within a specific distance and then geo within and geo intersects to find um, all points within a specific geometry or partially within a given uh, geometry. All of these are MongoDB compatible APIs, uh, GeoNear, Neosphere, GeoWithin, and GeoIntersects. All of these now work uh, with DocumentDB. Let's go ahead and walk you guys through a demo. All right, so similar to Srinath, I'm using Cloud9 for my demo. Cloud9 is an integrated ID built into the browser, which you can use to connect your database. Um, in my environment, I have a data set of several thousand restaurants located in New York City. Um, each document has an ID, which is unique, and also coordinates, so latitude, longitude, and the name of the restaurant. So for instance, this is Kosher Kitchen. It's located at this lat and this longitude. So for our demo, what we're going to do uh, to start things off first is we're actually going to go ahead and log into our database. So let me go ahead and do that. And I'm connecting to my document DB cluster. And let's go ahead and see the database we have. We're going to use test DB um, for this demo. And we're going to go ahead and create an index. So to create an index, we use the create index command. We specify that we want to create the index on the location field. Um, and we want to make it a 2D sphere index. So this is the location field, and we've just created an index on it. Now we want to find the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the geo near operation. And I just copy pasted the query, and we want to find 10 restaurants closest to this location, which let's say is the address of my apartment. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. And there you go. So we found the 10 closest restaurants sorted by distance in kilometers. Um, and as you can see, Hong Kong Express is right downstairs. So that's the closest, followed by a few more that are a little bit further, um, all the way up to two to three blocks from the address specified. You can also use other uh, query operators. For instance, if you want to find how many restaurants are within one kilometer of my location, for that, you can use min distance and max distance. So let's just go ahead and do that. In this case, I'm using a min distance of zero and max distance of thousand, which maps to one kilometers, one kilometer, sorry. And there's about 172 restaurants within a kilometer of the of the location that I specified. So that gives you a quick kind of an idea of the various geospatial uh, query capabilities that we provide. There's there's other operators as well that you know just in the interest of time we're gonna skip, but you can use the geo within operator if you want to find, let's say, documents within a polygon. For instance, if you want to find all restaurants within a specific set um, of, of geometry. With that, let me pivot back to my slides. All right, moving on. So next feature we have uh, is Performance Insights. So Performance Insights is a feature I think we released just a little more than a month ago, uh, earlier in May. Um, what is it? It's a new performance monitoring solution that you can enable on your DocumentDB instances for free. If you've used other AWS services, um, you know you may be familiar with Performance Insights. Uh, for instance, if you used Aurora, there's a variant of this that's available on Aurora as well. Um, so, you know, similar concept. Obviously, it's a different database engine, different use cases. So, you know, some of the experiences will be different, but the idea is the same. We want to give you a one-stop shop for you to go understand the various problems, uh, performance problems, or solve various performance problems that you're experiencing on your cluster. Uh, why does this matter? Because it helps you identify what is causing load on your instance and when specifically is it occurring. For instance, is it one query? Is it five different queries? Is it, you know, 10 different queries? Uh, Performance Insights helps you answer all of these questions. 
on the right here, I have a screenshot um, of what the dashboard looks like. And we'll, we'll walk you through a live demo, but the idea is you know, you're able to filter on top weights, top queries, top hosts, top databases, and also top applications, all sorted uh, by database load. So it's a one-stop shop, and the one primary metric that you care about is uh, database load. Uh, what are some example questions that you can answer? Um, you know, these things are questions that customers have actually asked us, and you know, engineers who are on call have actually had to answer these questions in some cases. So, you know, what we've really done with this feature is we've made this tool available to customers so they can answer it themselves. If customers want to know, you know, at what time was an unexpected load on their database, they're able to answer that. If customers want to know which queries or which applications had the most performance impact on their databases, they're able to answer that. Or if they want to double click into specific um, resources, for instance, which queries are consuming the most CPU or what is consuming high IOs. Uh, these are all things that customers you know, want to know either to investigate you know, a runaway query or identify a script that shouldn't be running at a given time that is. Performance Insights lets you do all of that uh, right from the console um, and for free. Let's quickly see a demo of the tool in action um, so you guys get to see what you would do if you were using Performance Insights to troubleshoot a solution. Sorry, a problem. So if you see my screen here, uh, I'm in the Document DB console, and to use Performance Insights, all you need to do is in the left nav, you'll see various um, fields here. Go ahead and click on Performance Insights. Once you come here, we are in preview. I should have called that out. Um, you know, we we will GA very soon, but at this point, we are in preview. Once you do that, you'll be able to select various instances for which Performance Insights it's turned on. So I have two um, clusters for which I've turned on Performance Insights. I'm going to go ahead and choose one of them. And here, let me just make it a little bit smaller. Uh, in this cluster, I had a few database events over the last, I want to say, few minutes to hours. The One of the key things to do here is you're able to you know, filter it by time. So for instance, if you want to view the last five minutes, I don't have much going on in the last five minutes, but if I filter for the last, let's say, hour, I have a little bit more happening. If I say last five hours, I have a little bit more happening. So now, once you have all your events pulled up, let's say you want to filter on the spike. So you're seeing the spike between 2140 and 2200. You want to figure out like what's causing that, what's really happening. So you can go ahead and zoom into that, and you'll see there were five, maybe six events that caused load on your database. Um, let's just arbitrarily pick maybe one of these. Let's go ahead and choose this one. Um, now, once you do that, you're actually able to see what's causing the load on the database. For instance, is it CPU? Is it IO? Is it a database latch? Or is it something else? Uh, in this case, you know we're seeing CPU across across these events, which is in green kind of you know one of the top top uh, causes and then you know a little bit of red which is maps to IO. Uh, while this is interesting, I think what's most interesting is top queries. So now we really want to know you know what are the top queries that that are causing the most load. So here I have a find query um, which is essentially finding a document and sorting it. So for instance we're trying to find all documents where first name is Jesse. Um, on the database BI customers. So that's the query. You know, I think it was run, there's multiple runs of it. All runs of that query do get grouped into one. Um, you know, there's some some load cost by an insert as well. For instance, we were inserting some data into the collection, but the find query was the one that consumed most resources. You're also able to filter on top hosts. Um, you know, so if this is important to you, you want to be able to pinpoint which IP addresses are causing these database events, you're able to do that with Performance Insights. Um, and same thing with top databases. So we had multiple, but PI customers was the, the database with the most load, uh, and then also top applications. Now let's just 
just to kind of understand how this works, let's take a different time dimension. And now I'm going to go ahead and filter on the two most recent events. And these, surprisingly, were purely CPU, which you know makes you wonder what kind of query was it. And if you go ahead and now hit the top query, you'll see that it was exclusively a find operation. Um, so similar, similarly to what we did a filter on the previous time period, we double clicked into a different time period. Um, you know, tried to see what were the top queries, and you know we saw that this query was causing the most load um, on your database. And you know, to turn performance insights on, all you need to do is you know you go to your cluster. So if I have several clusters for which performance insights is not turned on, you go choose the instance for which you want to turn that on. You click modify, and um, you should be able to modify it right from the console. I think I chose a cluster instead of the instance, but you can go ahead and choose the instance. Go ahead and click modify. And if you scroll down, there should be a box here which says enable performance insights. You go ahead and click that. You can choose the default key or a key of your choice. And that's pretty much how you would turn that on. We're very excited for Performance Insights. We feel like it's going to help solve a lot of important performance troubleshooting use cases. Um, however, you know it is still in preview. So if you see if you see any missing features, or if you want us to do a little bit more than what we do today for Performance Insights, you've tried the feature on, and you have additional feedback for us, you know, feel free to let us know. Um, there is still time till till when we GA it. So some room for improvement, especially if you if you as our customers think we should be doing something differently. So open to feedback as we take this from preview to GA. Uh, that pretty much wraps up all the demos and the presentations that we had for you. Um, the last feature, and this is not really a feature, but a very important pricing change that we made was the free trial. So I think earlier this year, I want to say we released the document DB free trial. With the free trial, you can use Document DB for free for 750 hours on a T3 medium instance. Um, the T3 medium instance gives you two vCPUs and four gigs of RAM, uh, also five gigs of storage, 30 million IOs, and five gigs of backup for one month. Uh, this was feedback that we received from developers on Twitter, on Stack Overflow, uh, other mediums. Customers just want to be able to try the service out for free. Um, this was not possible until January or I want to say February this year, but now you can try it out for free. So no cost um, absolutely to you to try the service out. Obviously, if you have used DocumentDB before, you are no longer eligible for the trial. The trial is exclusively uh, for new customers. You can go ahead and scan the barcode if you want to learn more. Um, to use the free trial, you don't really need to do anything special. You will go to the console, you create a cluster, and you choose the T3 medium instance type when creating a cluster, uh, and that will automatically get you onto the trial program, uh, obviously with the caveat that you're actually new and you have not used the service before. Uh, with that, I think that wraps it up. We'll open it up uh, to, to Q&A. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Um, you know, in addition to that, thank you for your time. Uh, and Please do the, the survey if you have any feedback for us. We're always looking to improve. Um, so we'll keep that on for you. And thank you again for taking time. Thank you.